chapter 11. We're going to be talking about service-oriented architectures. So this is actually really an important part of any kind of cloud computing thing that you do. So we're going to define and describe what service-oriented architecture is, compare and contrast the roles of web services and web pages, list some common examples of web services, discuss the benefits of treating a web service as a black box, right? And then discuss the governance challenges in using web services, and then discuss the role of the Web Service Description Language, WSDL, to describe a web service and its methods. So the big thing to remember about this is that we're going to talk about just the big components that comprise the system, the relationships and the information that the components share. Now, you can distribute your application throughout the cloud. That is a really beautiful way of dealing in a serverless environment or using containers or any other way you want to approach this, whether that's through Lambda or some other serverless compliant um, process so that you can actually turn your entire web app into just one giganto computer program that's running across the internet. And if a component fails, it's not that big a deal. You don't lose the whole application. And that's really what it is. It's an architectural approach. It's also a security governance, software development, and a lot of other approaches, but primarily as architectural, where you're building solutions through the integration of services. And those services can be as simple as an API. They can be as simple as a token. They can be as simple as a parser. Um, however you need to do it to make your program do what it needs to do. But the big thing here is that it's really a microservices architecture. You're treating each section of your program as a function, and each one of those functions is operating either within a container or some other kind of environment. Now, you can do things within that SOA to make the programs do a remote procedure calls to services. So you may have payroll that then goes and sends data to ADP or to paychecks or to FlexPay or to someone else. Then you may have a billing web service where you pay your car payment. So Toyota Motor Credit will come and hit my checking account and take their money. HR web services, I can't upload any new certificates I get, any changes in dependence or something else. That's all done through an API or a web form of some sort, right? Even as simple as doing a W2 or a W4, that's all done through a web form now. You don't really have to interact with the PDF that you're used to doing. You don't really have to interact with, you know, trying to fill out all these forms or other stuff because it can all be done online now. And that's really what you're doing. You're trying to make it easier for people and you're trying to turn your environment on your application into more of an atomic model. Right. So web services, though, are not just web pages. Right. There's some underlying code behind it. It's a program code that resides on the web and performs the specific tasks that other programs, not people use. So remember that when you're passing data from your W2 or your W4 form back into ADP or back into paychecks or into your HR system, it's not interacting with a person. I enter my data, I hit send or submit and boom, it's done. So programs are going to use that data. Now, a human being may look at it later on, just to make sure that I did something right. So there may be some kind of QA process involved here. But again, that idea is that these are tasks performed by web services, not by human beings. And that is your other big key to this whole process. Right? You want to turn weather conditions for a specific zip code. Well, boom, that's going to go and pull up any sensor that is in my zip code and send me that data. So whether AccuWeather or TrueWeather or something else, return real-time traffic conditions. If you pull up your, your Google Maps now or your Amazon apps or anything else that has to do with traffic, there you go. You'll actually have computers now that will design your entire route to give you the most effective delivery condition at all, depending on what's going on on the road or on the highway. You can return a stock price for any particular company. Then it's completely blind. I'll just go straight to MarketWatch. I'll go pull up the stock market and see what it looks like. I don't interact with the person. I don't interact with data. And that's the big thing to remember, right? Driving directions to a specific location, return to countries associated with an IP address for geofencing. These are all services. These are all services I'm going to consume. And these are all things that are done through an API, a web form, or some other service. And it can be a big glop, or it can be nicely formatted and set throughout the entire service-oriented architecture framework so that I'm interacting with a bunch of little programs instead of one big one. And that's the big thing. Your web page is just a form. It's just a data delivery point, or it's a data entry point, or it's both. That's it. All the other logic resides either in Lambda or some other independent container or something else that you don't have to worry about. 
So what we're going to do then is we're going to pass that message as queue or notification or something else to that web service. So I type in my zip code because I want my weather. Well, that is what gets passed off to the program. The program goes, oh, well, it's 9840. Okay, that will work. So it goes and pulls all the weather data for that by calling all the programs around. I would call my local weather. It would call uh, my TV station. It would call others and say, okay, here you go. Boom. Here's all your weather. And then drop it into a web page for me. And that's it. So it takes my input of a zip code and then outputs what that weather looks like. And all it's doing is working through an API. It's exchanging that message. That little chunk of data then returns a bigger chunk of data for me to consume so I know what the weather looks like. This is the core of SOA passing messages back and forth. How do I act on that? Do I error code out? What happens if I just hit enter and don't enter a zip code, right? Will you error out and say, oh no, I need to have a zip code, right? What about foreign zip codes? What about things like Canadian where it's letters and numbers instead of just numbers? How about stuff in other countries, right? So we have a lot of other kinds of data that we can pass to this to see if our message passing is gonna work. So we have to know what our data formats are, and then we have to be able to parse for those data formats, and then we have to know how those data formats are going to be used and what the returns are going to look like. Otherwise, we need to return an error code. Really straightforward programming, right? Sanitize, deliver the method, call it good. Now, there's a programmer site called xmethods.com, which is kind of interesting, where programmers can develop web services and share them with others, sometimes free, sometimes not. There are other websites like this. You can use GitHub. You can use um, the Amazon marketplace, the Azure marketplace. There's a lot of places you can go now to get these little programs or to get a serverless program to get something in a service-oriented architecture. You can even build WordPress as serverless if you want to. So even if you're not a developer, you can go ahead and take a look at things, maybe get a better idea of what kind of tasks are, can be performed by web services. But right now it's just about anything as a web service. And it really should be anything as a web service because it makes it a whole lot cleaner. It's a lot nicer. It keeps your bills down, keeps you from doing a lot of things that you probably don't want to have to pay for because of the money involved in running certain things. If you're doing a distributed programming, just like distributed computing, this just makes sense, right? So there's some real huge advantages to web services, primarily because of their distributed nature. Web services provide advantages to developers because you're just working on little chunks of code. Instead of working on a big, huge thing, you're just working on little chunks of code. Well, if I get that, the zip code, well, maybe I can make it prettier. Maybe I can just focus on the presentation of that data once I've got the data coming back in. So I can focus on little things and get really big bang for my buck and I can get things done quicker, right? Honestly, instead of having to focus on the whole program, I can focus on little functions and I can make those functions work better. When programmers who are developing code, they break large complex operations into smaller, more manageable chunks. And now you're just taking that and shoving that into the cloud as smaller, more manageable chunks. And as they implement better and more well-defined tasks as functions, ideally each function should perform that one task instead of more than one, you'll always have at least two tasks. The thing it's supposed to do, and then what happens if it gets an error code. So that's exactly what it should be doing. There should be some kind of error correction, error kind of catching mechanism in there as well, because you don't want it to fail outright if an error condition happens. You want to have a way of gracefully handling whatever errors end up going on. So as well, right, programmers can reuse these little function snippets of code in other programs, which saves development and testing time and ultimately reduces costs. So that's another big part of this is making sure that if you get a good, beautiful um, function that you want to use, now that can be used anywhere. If you're going to be parsing data from a zip code or from a TV screen or from something else, right, I'm going to enter some data somewhere, well, you can use that in other programs doesn't mean you can't turn around and use it someplace else and that's another big one once you've got it going once you have a beautiful function you're good to go and again that follows under not to reinvent the wheel right which is another programmer's written code or performs the task your programs need you should reuse that code there are some caveats to that if you are writing proprietary code you really shouldn't use um, public open source code you can use it as inspiration, but you shouldn't directly use it straight up to solve your problem. So there's some other things you do need to be aware of, especially how um, code works, why it works the way it works, and what the copyright limitations are around it. Some of it are just um, by credit or some of them are by payment. So really understand your um, Creative Commons, really understand the difference between private and public code, understand the reuse, code reuse rules around what not just is on the website, but how your company looks at code reuse, especially from outside sources.
Web services are ideal though for code reuse. Once you've got an elegant solution, you should be able to use it everywhere that it makes sense to use it. And that's the big one right there. Once you've got it, you can go around and use it. Now, the disadvantage, if the network dies, right? A web service will be a lot slower if the program is called to a function that resides on the same computer or on the network if the network dies. So you do have a problem if, if the network dies or if something happens um, or if you um, have too many containers on one computer system. So again, you're going to have to learn, you're going to architect and manage a lot of this stuff to make sure that it's robust, scalable, fails over, and all the other things. So you can scale your web server, right, much like you need to, especially if you're going to do a service-oriented architecture, you have got to be able to scale. And that is purely an architectural decision, right? And that you're using a load balancing model and that load balancing model is not only gonna happen at the front door where the internet comes in, but you should be using that on anything else that needs to scale and that includes your SOA architecture. So your container system, your web services, if you're running those on ECS or, or any other component, they all have to be able to scale. They all have to have triggers, which means more inter-process communications. Your message queuing, your orchestration between services and, and APIs and, and your web presentation becomes a really big architectural and developmental concern. It can be a lot of fun to solve the problem though, right? So you're gonna hear something called loosely coupled and tightly coupled. So in this one, we're just gonna cover what the word coupled means, right? It describes the degree of dependence between a calling program and the web service. So if I am dropping out and saying, I need my weather, then it's going to be tightly coupled. The weather has to go to my zip code or it has to go to some form of a zip code that the system will understand, otherwise it won't work, right? If it's loosely coupled, I can give it part of, a, of an item and it will be able to figure out what I'm wanting to do or will give me a sheath of probabilities, things that I will probably use. So ideally, to use the web service, the program only needs to know the location of the web service, its URL, the names of the functions, the method, and what kind of data I want. In this way, programs and web services can be loosely coupled as long as it knows where it is, what it's doing, what it's supposed to do, and what are the parameters. Because of the program's loosely coupled relationship to a web service, it's possible for a developer to update that web service with a newer version for programs that use that service without any issues in the updates. Unless, of course, the update is bad and the coder did really bad work on it. So that's another thing to know about is that when you get into this level of continuous integration, continuous development, CI, CD, especially in a service-oriented architecture, you really do want to test things before they go live. But it's really possible for the developer just to throw their stuff out on there and as a new version into whatever it is that you're running it on, whether that's in a container or in a Lambda service or in a EC2 instance or however, and basically break things. So you really do need to have some kind of QA process there. But what ends up happening though, as for everybody other than the developer, this becomes a black box, right? There comes a point where the software developer even doesn't care about how processing is performed, but instead knows that the code when provided valid inputs will produce a predictable result. So I know that with my weather, my AccuWeather, if I enter my zip code, I'm going to get a very predictable result, what the weather will look like for the next 10 days, and an increasing order of probability that this will be true. So developers can treat that web service as a black box. We don't care how it does it. What we care about is the input and the output. So as long as the developer trusts that with a valid input, the web service will function consistently. You don't really need to know how it works. Now, a lot of people are gonna to wanna to know how it works and there's gonna be a lot of security engineers that are gonna to wanna to know how it works and wanna know how it airs out and what happens if there's an air condition or any other thing that goes into software development from a QA viewpoint. But from a user viewpoint, it could very well just be a black box. They're not going to care. They just want their weather if they give you a zip code because this is what the thing is supposed to do. So black box is kind of a thing, probably more geared towards users, maybe towards developers if they're in a hurry. But there's going to be people that really do need to understand how the code works, especially from QA security. And then your lead developers are going to need to know too. So there's some web service and interoperability things to know about is that the biggest advantage to web services is their interoperability, right? In other words, they can be called from programs using any kind of programming language. It can be something from a desktop, C, Go, Ruby, um, C Sharp, C++, meaning the same web service can be called by anything, PHP, Java, C, it just you name it, it can be called by it. And if you're doing it right, you can actually do this as a desktop and pull down the data. You've seen the little tiles on your computers that have the weather. Yeah, that's the same thing as your web service. It's exactly the same thing on the back end. 
It's exactly AccuWeather. The computer instead is passing that zip code or that geographic location, and that is what's getting called back to you so you can actually see it. So that web service can be a desktop, it can be web, it can be on your phone as an app, you name it. That AccuWeather web service is everywhere now, honestly. It's on my phone, it's on my desktop, it's on my tile bar, it's on my sweetie's phone, it's on the web page, and it's probably the same thing in the background. Honestly, it probably is all AccuWeather all the time. So you do have something called a web service description language, a WSDL, which consists of one or more functions, each of which performs that specific task and normally returns a specific adult a result. All right, so behind the scenes, the web service description language um, uses to describe the web service and its methods. So it's basically um, an API map. How do I use it? When do I use it? What can I send it? What do I get back out of it? So within the web service, each function has a unique name and receive zero or more parameter values, you know, such as my zip code. And then programs that use this to determine the available functions, parameter types, and more. So every pro program has got something like this, right? What the expected input, expected output, um, unique names, unique processes, um, what it can take, what it can't take in terms of data inputs and outputs. You'll see this in any program that has really good documentation. So that WSDL is really kind of important if you want to document your web service so that other people can use it or even other programmers in your organization can use it. The documentation becomes a really important part of the whole process here. So before a developer can use a web service with an application though, however, comma, the company's IT staff should ensure the web service implementation and deployment satisfies their policies and procedures, right? So again, you're going to walk into QA, you're going to walk into test, you're going to walk into your security cycle, you're going to walk into your governance cycle, there'll be someone that signs off on it, just a given. Right? There's always going to be that governance around how do we do things on the network and what that will actually look like. So we do need to make sure that we do have um, policies and procedures in place to make sure that something doesn't break along the way. So there's some really good considerations for web services, right? The solution must be developed and deployed by a reputable company. You're not going to trust Dan's programming company and nor should you. Honestly, you don't want to trust Dan's programming company. You're going to trust Microsoft. You'd probably trust AccuWeather. You'd trust Amazon. You'd probably trust IBM. You'd probably trust Raytheon. So again, it's that whole idea that the more reputable the company, the better chance that your app is actually going to do what you need it to do. Your web service is going to do what they need to do. That any solution cannot be dynamically changed without the company's notification or approval unless you want to transform data locally. Right, so if you're pulling in data from AccuWeather and you've got some really cool animations or graphics, you know, like little lightning bolts coming out of the cloud, then that's something you don't need to worry about because you can program that locally. But if you want to change and get a bigger answer back to that zip code, you want more data from around it, that may not work. Or you can, but you could overlay radar data with AccuWeather data. So again, there's ways of doing this, but if you're going to try to change the backend API or the backend service, you probably want to try to get either notification or approval unless it's public. If it's public, just fork it on GitHub, do what you want to do and see if people really like it. All right, the solution must provide secure communications to avoid threats. So everything in data in motion has to be encrypted. Everything. The solution must be scalable to meet potential demand. In other words, it must work in a good, stable, scalable environment, whether that's container or um, operating system, ECS, EC2, whatever it needs to be done. And then the solution must be able to be validated, that if I give it a zip code, I'm going to get back that data for that zip code. You really do want to make sure the solution can be validated. This is important, especially when you're doing math. If you're doing an online calculator, uh, sin, cosine, tangents, geometry, or things like that, you want to make sure that that solution can be validated, because most people don't know how to do math like that at least on the top of their head, so they're going to trust the output. And if the output's wrong, they're doing it during a test. That can be problematic. So there's some key terms that you do want to be aware of. You've got the architecture. Your service-oriented architecture is really where you get to sit down and design cool stuff. For in a lot of ways, it's going to be a black box. You have tightly coupled and loosely coupled. We're going to go for loosely coupled on this one for our interoperability. Methods, service-oriented architecture, and then the WSDL. So you definitely want to take, make sure that you understand all these things because this is really cool. This is where the cloud is really starting to go and where it's really starting to take off now is these little tiny snippets of code everywhere that basically treats your, your um, entire internet more like little USB sticks than anything else. It's a neat way of building stuff and it really has become quite popular. All right, and as usual, we're using Gamsa. So thank you for attending this lecture. This one was really kind of quick, which is nice. And I will see you in the next lecture.